Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. How many of you like having a little bit of fun in church on a Sunday? Glad that you are here. Welcome to City of Life Church. So glad that you're with us. My name is Pastor Justin. I serve as one of the associate pastors here. And if you hadn't already seen, we're in the middle of our series called City of Life Summer Playlist. Each week, we're having a little bit of fun listening to some absolute game-changing songs and then drawing some ideas from Scripture that I believe can be a real encouragement to you. But man, today is such an important day. I believe you're here by divine appointment. I don't believe you're here on accident. It's not just like, oops, I'm in church. I believe God has a purpose for you today in the room, for you online. There's an opportunity we have. And as Pastor Mahdi is saying, we're not here just checking boxes. I'm not just here to do the church thing. Like we're here to really worship him, to connect with him and to receive from him. And I believe that we have that opportunity today. And so getting into the word of God together, we have the chance to connect with his heart, to get to know who he is and what he's trying to do in our lives. And I'm so excited to bring the word today because this is a word for people who are going through change who feel like life is changing all around them am i in the right place can anyone identify with me that like life is changing things are changing transition is happening if you look back i don't know three years ago 2019 if you could sit down and have lunch with 2019 you What would you say? Buy toilet paper. (laughs) What words of warning would you give? How would you encourage yourself? Who would you tell yourself to hug a little tighter? What would you be able to say? See, usually this question is posed for like, you from 10 years ago. You from 20 years ago, you as a kid, but we're just talking three short years. And everything has changed. I'm preaching to myself and to a people who are living in a life that is different than it was just months and months ago. To a people who really could have never pictured life looking like it does today. We're living in a world and in a time that is wildly and undeniably prophetic. I don't try to just drop the heavy stuff right away, but what I mean is that this is a moment where light is shining brighter and dark is getting darker. Like it's getting more polarizing. There's no kind of comfortable middle ground anymore. The whole earth is aching and groaning for the fulfillment of God's promises, for justice to be seen in the earth. And you feel it in people, you feel it in culture, you feel it all around. Like I was just talking to someone and they were like, hi, hug. Like we don't even know if we can hug each other anymore. (laughs) We don't make plans anymore. We're like, we might have a birthday party next week, but I don't know, you know how it is. We don't plan on anything. Airlines let you cancel up to 10 minutes before. Y'all remember when it was like a three-year contract to fly? And now they're like, if you don't show up, it's fine. It's whatever. Nothing is set in stone anymore. Everything is like shifting sand. Every institution that used to be trusted is now being questioned. We're living in a life that is different. It's different. It's different. It's different. And this word is going to speak, I believe, to people who are navigating that kind of change. And I don't know, y'all, I feel something so unique in this service. I'm like barely getting from one word to the next because truly, like, I believe the presence of God is here in a heavy and substantial way. What a privilege to be able to come right into his presence. What a privilege to touch him. You know, in scripture, it says there's a woman who just touched the very edge of Jesus' garment and she was healed of 12 years of sickness in her body. I'm talking about a God whose very presence heals and restores. 
What could happen in your life today? God, we invite you into this place. We've been singing it, we've been saying it, but now, God, we posture our hearts. Lord, would you pour out miracles online and in this room? Come on, if you need a miracle today, I know we're just going way off like schedule. If you need a physical miracle, could you just lift your hand? If you're dealing with a sickness, a diagnosis, yeah. Could you just stand, those of you who are believing for a miracle? Just stand right where you are. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. If you're watching online, type, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. This doesn't have to be some performance. This doesn't have to be some hoop you jump through. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. He bore the stripes on his back. He bled and his body was broken for our healing. And if nothing else, he pumped the brakes on this service right here, right now for you to show his loving kindness to you. You're not forgotten. He has not overlooked you. He has not forgotten where you are. He's heard every prayer. And today I want to agree with you for an outpouring of healing. If you're in your seats, would you maybe just stretch your hand toward one of these who are standing and also remembering those who are online. God, do what you do best. We pray for a miracle in these bodies, a miracle in these hearts and minds and families and lives. God, I believe that people have walked in this room today with heaviness, but that the weight of your glory will outweigh the heaviness of what they've been carrying. That there are those who have just received news or are awaiting news of a diagnosis, and it has been the only thing filling their mind. But the Bible says the train of God's robe fills the temple. Your presence is so big, it fills every part. There's no room for anything else. There's no room for that fear. There's no room for that doubt or that worry. Your presence pushes out everything that has occupied our minds. I pray for a miracle, tangibly evident, physical miracles. We pray that we would hear report after report of healing miracles in bodies, that chronic issues would be reversed, that there would be breakthroughs in mental health, in relationships. We receive, we receive what you have for us, God. And Lord, we agree together in faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Come on, can we lift up praise today to this God who is so good and so faithful? Yeah, today something special is happening. I don't know what, I don't know what's gonna happen to be honest. <laughs> you came here by divine appointment. And I wanna speak to a people who are living in a life that is different. If we're not careful, we can just take every moment and say, I want it that way. I want to go back to three years ago. I want to go back to 10 years ago. I want it that way. But it's different. It's different now. I'm speaking to you lovingly, pastorally, like I would a brother, a sister, even my own son. I want you to hear me. Life has changed. God has not. Life is shifting sand, but God is a rock who is higher than us. He is the only stable thing in your life. And if you thought everything good was going to stay the same, then maybe it was faulty expectation that has led to your current disorientation because he never promised us that life would be steady. He promised us that he would be steady. And welcome to the wild side. Life is different now. It's unpredictable, but we have to figure out how to keep going. Life is different. Look at someone next to you and say, it's different. Thank you, Michael. It's different. It's different. I got to set up a story for you. I'm going to be preaching out of Isaiah 43, or at least trying to. I don't know what, what God wants to do today, because second service, y'all came here with something else. <laughs> something else. Y'all slept in and then came in and just ready for what God has. But I want to try to preach out of Isaiah 43, and I want to set up this story for you. Maybe you're not familiar with the Old Testament. I think most of us perhaps have some cinematic pictures 
of the Old Testament going all the way back to like Egypt. Maybe you've seen like the Ten Commandments movie or like the Prince of Egypt. How many of you all seen Prince of Egypt? Prince of Egypt. That's a good movie right there. At least the soundtrack. Please listen to it. Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston. Who knows a miracle? I'm not a backstreet boy, a side street guy. I can't do it. Prince of Egypt, you at least have cinematic imagery of how Israel was enslaved in Egypt. We have Moses, and he's like, let the people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, let the people go. No, plagues, fire, lots of crazy stuff. I'm simplifying. And then they get led out of Egypt. They come to the Red Sea. Oh, no, Pharaoh's chasing us. There's a sea in front of us. What are we going to do? God opens the sea, lets the people through. Pharaoh chases them. Water crashes down on Egypt. God kills all the enemies. The people of Israel walk into their promised land. Again, I'm oversimplifying it. This is like eight books of the Old Testament. But they find their promised land, and they go out of slavery into their promised land. Everything is as it should be. The promise of God is fulfilled, and that should be the happily ever after right? Like that should be where it stops, but it doesn't because the people of Israel are not much different than us. They're finally in their promised land with everything that they wanted and they mess it up. Has anyone ever messed it up? (laughs) This guy. They mess it up. In the wilderness, they were learning how to trust God and follow him and him alone and believe him. Then they get in their promised land and they stop trusting and they start turning to other things. Because now that they're comfortable, they start to dabble in, well, what about this or what about that? They turn to other religions. They start to engage in pagan worship. They start to sleep around with people from uh, like wicked nations, which God told them, hey, do not do that. And they start to get too comfortable in their blessing. Can I give you a, a loving caution here? When you find yourself in a place that you've prayed for and waited for, when you have seen yourself standing in a promise, don't stop doing the things that got you there just because you happen to have made it there. Okay, don't stop doing what got you here just because you got there. In other words, when you start to see harvest, don't stop planting seed. Keep sowing even while you're reaping. Because if you stop doing today what you did yesterday, tomorrow you will not see fruitfulness. You have to keep planting, have to keep sowing. What do I mean? When, time, when times were really difficult and tough, you, you hit the floor in your room and you were like, God, get me out of this one. Save me. Help me. You prayed your prayers. You cried your tears. And he did it. He got you out. And then what'd you do? You got up off that floor and you stopped the prayer and you stopped the tears because now things are good. When things are good, you know where we still need to be? On the floor praying and crying and believing for him to keep doing what it is that he said he would do. Your marriage hit a rough patch. I love how we say that like it's a rough patch. For some of us, it's a downright pothole, like everything falls. i lucky if you just have a patch. Sometimes it's like a minefield. And when your marriage is struggling, what do you do? You say, you know what? We got to get this right. Let's go to counseling. Let's pray. Let's like reprioritize. I'm going to change the schedule. We're going to, we're going to fix this. You put all this effort and energy in and God brought you through it and the marriage is healthy now. And what are y'all doing? Not making time for each other, not spending time in counseling, not working on anything, sitting in bed on your phones. And it's like, just because it's healthy, you stop doing the right things. And what, you're going to wait till it blows up again to then get back into that place of intention and effort? Don't just have date night because the marriage is falling apart. Sometimes you got to have date night when things are good because you actually want to keep it good. Don't stop doing what got you there. You know, we're approaching one of my favorite times of the year. This week marks the halfway point of 2022. I feel like that's really spiritual. Also, just like, think about them goals that you set. (laughs) I think some of us this year were like, I'm not doing, I'm not doing that this year. (laughs) No goals. Catch you in 23, but just not this year. (laughs) Maybe you did set goals. Here you are. Here's your halfway point. How are you going? How's it going? Maybe you're like, oh, I got to start some things now. Remember that one mile walk you promised yourself in January? Well, it's July soon. It's time to go put the shoes on, go do the thing. And you're like, nah, it's too hot. I'll wait till October. (laughs) We'll get there. But it's the middle of the year, the middle of this new season. And remember, God promised through our pastor, he spoke a word to our church that this year we would find ourselves living in the future good old days. It's kind of a beautiful poetic expression to say one day you're going to look back at 2022 and realize, man, those were good days. Do we really believe that? Have you said that? 
Dream team, staff, pastors, me? Or was it like a keychain that we got in January and then we lost it at the bottom of our bag? Because that was the word of God to our church, that we will be living in the future good old days. It's hard because when I look around, not everything is good. So either I believe, oh, that wasn't quite it for me. Maybe God got it wrong because this doesn't look good. Or I believe even though my eyes don't see what I expect it to look like, God is not a liar. He does not lie. What he says is true. And perhaps in all this wild upheaval that we're living in, if life isn't good, maybe if what around you isn't good, God is trying to produce something good in you. And if you look back at 2022 and you can say it made me more like Jesus, it refined me, it broke me of myself, and it made me reliant on him, then it will have been one of the best things that ever happened to you. Because even though it's difficult on the outside, what if he's producing something in you, refining you? What if this is the year that you finally say, I surrender? <laughs> Because I can't do it anymore. What if you get driven all, to, all the way to the end of yourself this year? Then it will have been worthwhile. But we're living in a time that is different. It's different. Look at somebody and say, it's different. I just, I really want you to embrace that. Lovingly, I want you to embrace it. Because we're not going back. Okay? We're not going back. It's different. It's going to continue changing. And in Isaiah 43, Isaiah is prophesying to the people of Israel who have found themselves, like they had their promised land and they messed it up. They stopped doing what they needed to do. And they started worshiping idols and started behaving in ways that were contradictory to their covenant with God. And you know what happens? God's like, okay, if you're going to step outside of the, the covenant we've made, the blessing and protection I've given you, you're stepping outside of it. You're on your own. And you know what happens? They get beat up. Like these people get messed up. Other armies come in and just like, you hear it through the Old Testament. It's like the Amorites and the Moabites and like all these people just come in and like steal and, and just absolute terror, but perhaps none more sinister than the Babylonians. And at this point in scripture, we've seen that Israel has been absolutely ransacked by Babylon, this debaucherous, godless culture who comes in and just basically exiles them. They no longer have their promised land. They're scattered all over the earth. They're enslaved. They're oppressed again. This is what strikes me. They already, they did this already. They were enslaved in Egypt. And now here they are again. Moment of truth here. Has anyone ever fought the same battle twice? Or is that just me? Because sometimes we like to act like, oh, it's, I, I just had one problem one time 10 years ago, and now it's over, and that's my testimony. Y'all, my testimony is a little more rated R than that. <laughs> it's not like one thing 10 years ago. It's like Tuesday, last Tuesday, something happened, and I'm battling through it, and I'm working through it. Have you ever fought the same battle twice, three times, four times, five times? Those familiar moments where the enemy seems like he's coming in again, and you're fighting again, and you're like, wait, I thought this addiction was broken. I laid it down. I had that moment, but now I've relapsed, and I'm finding myself back in it. I thought this pattern was over. I said, no more affairs, and yet I find myself once again in this behavior. Or maybe I said, okay, I had a powerful moment in church. No more depression. No more anxiety. But now I find myself right back in the same thing. Have you ever found yourself back again in the same battle? Because that's where Israel is. It's not super encouraging. It's not, it's not easy to talk about, but it's real life. It's real for us to find ourselves here again. It's battle again. We're fighting again. And instead of turning all your anger and frustration at God, this is one of the best times to look at yourself and say, where did I go wrong? What happened here? Because Israel, the whole reason that they started to get attacked from enemies is because they went from trusting God to worshiping idols. They're worshiping idols, and then that opens them up to the attacks of their foreign enemies. And you know what they do in exile? When they're in Babylon, instead of getting into their, into their prayer closets and saying, God, we repent, we turn to you, save us from these people, they're in those prayer closets worshiping idols still. They double down on their behavior. Their trinkets and their statues, they're, they're saying like, well, I just maybe, I'm, I, I feel Babylonian now. They gave me a Babylonian name. I dress like a Babylonian. All my friends are Babylonian. Instagram is Babylonian. Twitter's Babylonian. The news is Babylonian. Everything seems like culture is, is permeating my life. Life, so I'm just going to live it out. And God is saying, you're, you're missing the point. You don't even belong to this culture. 
and you've been swallowed up by it. We have to be careful that we don't double down. And that's where Isaiah starts to speak to the people of God, to a people who are swallowed by culture. And God says this in 43.10. He says, but I have witnesses, O Israel. You are my witnesses and my servants, chosen to know and to believe me and to understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never was and never will be. I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. Verse 12, whenever you've thrown away your idols, I've shown you my power. Whenever you've thrown away your idols, I've shown you my power. Do you see the promise that is here? And yet also the condition. He says, I'm going to show you my power when you throw away your idols. If we look at this as a promise, who determines the outpouring of God's power? His people. He said, y'all ready yet? Because I'm ready. And it's, it's really nice for, for us to come in church and say, Maranatha, come into our lives, come into our culture. But yet we've found ourselves focused and fixated, giving our attention and our worship to something other than him. And he's saying, hey, the moment that you throw that away, I'm ready to, to pour out my power. I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. But whenever you throw away your idols, you know who Isaiah is prophesying to? Israel, not Babylon. In other words, the people of God, not the world out there. Isaiah is not standing on some mountainside saying, all you unbelievers, throw away your idols. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, hey, believers, throw away your idols. The world is going to keep getting darker. How can those who don't know the one true God do anything other than worship false gods? They don't know the one true living God. But we who know him have turned our backs and focused our attention and our affection on idols. And I know this sounds crazy because we're not living in an ancient culture. So the people of God then were worshiping statues and figurines. But what about today? What has received your attention and your affection in your worship? Because worship isn't just this. Worship is this. <laughs> worship is this. <laughs> worship is this. What has received your energy and your affection? Because God is saying, hey, whenever you throw those idols away, I'll show you my power. There is power after purging. When you clean out the house, God can fill the house. When you make room for it, he will fill it. When you are empty, he will fill. But sometimes we're just too full. We're like, God, I want you. He's like, There's, where am I supposed to go? You're full. You have relegated an hour and 20 minutes on a Sunday for me. And everything else is packed full of like this or like this or like this. Like it's constant energy. He's saying, do you have room for me to be number one? What if it costs you some time? What if you have to like actually like get in your room and posture yourself in prayerful worship with me? What if it's going to affect your schedule? What if it's going to affect your money? What if it's going to affect your time? What if it's going to cost you something? He says, whenever you're ready to throw away your idols, I'll show you my power. And so today, I want you to really critically consider what has become an idol in my life. Again, we sang it, like, burn my idols to ashes. That can't just be something that we sing for, like, other people, like, burn their idols to ashes. It's got to be for us. There is room to grow. And if you're in here and, like, I am 100% focused on Jesus and there is nothing in my life that ever consumes my attention, please come take this mic from me and preach. Because <laughs> that's not even me. I get distracted. I find myself giving my energy and my attention and my focus, and then I come back to myself and I realize, wait a minute, it's always you. It's always supposed to be you. Forgive me, and I want to lay it down. I'm not here to shame anyone for having something in your life that has grown out of proportion. I'm here to remind you what to do with it. Take that thing and lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Lay it on the altar. Throw away those idols. 
Instead of looking at it as something to be ashamed of, look at it as fuel to throw on the fire. And the more idols we have, great. The more we throw on the altar, the brighter the fire burns because when you lay it down, he shows you his power. So whatever's consuming you today, you look at it as something that you have to give, something you have to offer. It's not your shameful secret to keep hidden. It is a a log to throw on the fire of God's glory. What an opportunity we have to throw away that which is consuming us. He goes on, with one word I've saved you. You've seen me do it. You're my witnesses that it's true. From eternity to eternity, I'm God, and no one can oppose what I do. The Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says, for your sakes, I will send an invading army against Babylon that will walk in almost unscathed and the boasts of the Babylonians will turn to cries of fear. You know what I love? God says, I'm going to take care of Babylon. You don't have to fight the war. Israel, it's not your job to conquer Babylon. I will wage war against them, says the Lord. Church, it is not our job to dismantle the injustice of culture. God will take care of that. He will bring justice in more ways than we in our feeble attempts ever could. We need to stop focusing on Babylon and start focusing on who we are as Israel. We need to come back to our identity and be true to who we're called to be. I see too many believers focusing on how bad the world is and how bad it's getting. Scripture promises us it's going to get way worse. What do you expect? You're like hoping and changing that those who who maybe don't have the answer will suddenly start to behave as they do. Stop worrying about Babylon. God will take care of that. Start looking in the mirror of God's word and saying, oh my gosh, Babylon is on me. Like I need to take off some of this that I put on. I need to get back to the name God has called me, not the name culture gave me. To the behaviors God has taught me, not the customs that culture has taught me. To the lifestyle that God has laid out for me rather than fitting in with the culture of the world around me. Don't worry about Babylon. God will take care of that. Worry about you. You've got some growing and some changing to do. He says, I'll take care of it. I'll send an army. I'll bring justice. And I believe he will. He says, I'm the Lord, your holy one, in verse 15. Israel's creator and king, verse 16. I'm the Lord who opened a way through the waters. He's talking about Egypt here. So it's very vivid. I opened a way through the waters, making a path right through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses to lie beneath the waves dead, their lives snuffed out like candle wicks. We don't really talk about this a lot, but God kind of just like shows his cards here. He shows that he was at work all along. Because Israel, as they're like running from Egypt, they're like, let's get out of here. And I don't think they talk like that. But they're like, let's get out of here. And they're running and they look and they're like, oh no, Pharaoh's coming. The armies are coming. We're in trouble. And they have all this fear. They have all this worry. And they get to the Red Sea and they're like, we have this in front of us. And the enemy is winning because he's attacking. And God reveals later in Isaiah, that was not no plan of the enemy. I drew them into the desert. I brought them to chase you, not to scare you, but I brought them to a place where I could bring justice. He said, I made them chase you. And sometimes we get so worried about how bad things are. What if God is orchestrating a platform for his victory in the earth? Yes, things, things seem dark, but what if he is setting the stage for the glory to be seen. He brought Pharaoh into the desert to chase them. And then he opened the sea. And sometimes we think the blessing was just that the sea opened, but also the blessing was that the sea closed on top of the enemies of God. That he isn't just making a way for you. He's not just opening a door for you, but he's shutting the door on the enemy in your life. He's got a plan. And maybe that's why life is so different right now. Maybe that's why things are so different right now. You're like, I lost my, my job, my schedule. I lost my comfort. Maybe God drowned the enemy that was overtaking you. Ooh, I feel like preaching. Maybe the things that have been stripped away, the things that seemed so close to your identity, maybe they became places of compromise in your life. And God has closed the door on that and now you're here like in the desert like stripped away of everything that you hid behind maybe that's why things different are different and you're like i want it that way when things were predictable and he's like no no i've stripped away all the comfort because it was killing you 
It was choking out your faith. Have you ever been so comfortable you forgot to pray? Yeah. Your prayer is like, thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. What? <laughs> but it's when you're in the desert and you say, Father, I cannot make it a day without you. You are the breath in my lungs today. Help me today, Jesus. Help me get through this moment. I need you in my marriage. I need you in my family. I need you in my life. That's the kind of desert prayer that can ignite our faith like comfort never could. And God opened the sea for Israel, but he drowned Egypt. Maybe God has preserved you through all of this insanity for the last three years, but he's also purging you of the things that are in you that need to go. He says, I did all that. Talks about the greatest miracle in the Old Testament. And then look at verse 18. But forget all that. God, what? <laughs> forget the greatest miracle of the Old Testament? Forget all of that. Because like, wait a minute, God, you were really hyping me up. You were like, I'm the God who did this. I killed Egypt. I made a way. I killed them. I snuffed them out like candle wicks, but forget it. Wait, that's the only thing that encouraged me. That's the thing I've been testifying about for five years. That's always my go-to when people say, you know, what are you grateful for? Well, I'm grateful for how God got us through the Red Sea. And God's saying, enough. Enough of that. Yes, that will always be part of your story, but I have a new thing that I'm trying to do in you. I've got something greater, something better. Verse 18, forget all of that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. 19, I'm going to do a brand new thing. See, it's already begun. Don't you see it? You want it that way, but God has something new in front of you. And some of us are so backward focused that we're missing the purpose of this moment. You're alive today on assignment. You're here for a reason. This is, like I said, one of the most wildly prophetic times in history. And you know who's not here right now? Peter and James and John and all of these men that we read about and people that we read about in scripture. And you know who is here? Justin and Anthony and Debbie and Amanda. We are alive today on divine assignment. There's purpose to it. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Don't you see it, says God. You have to see this new thing. Everything in life is changing. I'm sure you feel it that like the tectonic plates of law have been shifting in culture. And then there's these like ramifications of, earth, of like seismic proportions. It feels like earthquakes happening in our country. It feels like that globally things are shifting and changing. It feels like Culture has shifted. Things are more polarized. And there's so much vitriol, so much hate. And, and people are absolutely um, burning bridges. It's not about having communication anymore. And let's try to know it's either you are here or you are there. There is no more bridge building. It is all about finding your corner, finding your camp, finding your tribe. Even work has changed. People aren't going to work. <laughs> Y'all felt that? <laughs> Because you like walk in a place and you're like, hello, <laughs> help. <laughs> Experts are calling it the great resignation. Around 70% of people have left their careers. Do you not see that that is spiritual? Because I would say maybe five years ago, we were a culture who was sacrificing our marriages and our children on the altar of a paycheck. Americans were overworked and obsessed with money and obsessed with title and position and their homes were falling apart. And now we're living in an era where people don't care anymore about titles and paychecks. They're saying, wait a minute, my home life is more important. My time is more important. My physical health is more important. Forget the paycheck. Do you not see that God is doing a new thing? Because maybe we were destroying ourselves, chasing money, and now we're realizing, wait, that spouse of 20 years, maybe they are of greater value than the money that I'm trying to bring in these kids that are in my life. Maybe I've been working 10 hour days and overlooking my greatest inheritance. I believe the enemy launched an attack on the earth two years ago and God said, no, no, I'm going to take that and turn it somehow, some way for good. And if y'all are going to be locked up in your house for two years, maybe I'm going to open your eyes to who's in that house and the purpose of that house. It's no longer about empires. It's about households. It's no longer about titles. It's about families. It's no longer about positions. It's about husbands and wives and daughters and sons and mothers and fathers. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not see it? 
It's already happening. It's here. It's not later. It's not, it's not happening soon. It's right here. Right now, we've got to open our eyes to the fact that he's doing something new. He's doing something different in your life. It's different. It's different. But it is him. He is at work. And he says, I'll make a road through the wilderness of the world for my people to go home. I'll create rivers for them in the desert. He's saying, I'm going to bring you out of captivity. I'm going to get you back to your promised land. And verse 20, the wild animals in the field will thank me. God, what? (laughs) Why are you saying this stuff? (laughs) Why are we talking about wild animals, God? He says, the jackals and the ostriches. I don't even know what an ostrich looks like, God. (laughs) Why are we talking about this? And he says that these desert animals will thank me because they get water in the wilderness, springs in the desert, that my chosen ones could be refreshed. Do you see what he's saying? He says, I'm going to bring you out into the desert to get you on the way home. And there in the middle of the desert, I'm going to create rivers of water. And these jackals... And desert dwellers and ostriches who've never seen a river, who've never seen water, are going to begin to thank me and praise me. Because since my people were in the desert, the climate of the desert changed. See, the last miracle was that God took pre-existing water, moved it, and then moved it back. That is miraculous. I'm not minimizing it. But now he's saying, I'm bringing water where there never was water. I'm going to bring you to a place so dry, so barren, so empty, and then I'm going to release rivers of living water through you because of you. And every desert dweller is going to thank me as a result because they're going to get to drink. Super poetic language. Let me bring it to the here and now. You and your spouse used to play happy, perfect couple. Every picture was soft smile. Everything was wonderful. But inside, your marriage was falling apart. And in the last two years, you have had to come face to face with the reality that you need Christ at the center of your marriage, that there are truths that must be told, work that must be done. And previously, all the couples that used to just like your posts are now going to see the refining that's happening in your marriage. And the 10 couples who have surrounded you and been dry and empty in their marriages, they're going to see your healing journey. They're going to see your transformation. They're going to see what real love looks like beyond a soft smile on Insta. And it's going to unlock a river of living water that will bless them. Water that they never knew existed. Your marriage might be the only one that has Christ in it, but those 10 couples who never knew Jesus are going to see, wait a minute, we're barely making it through. I know they barely made it through, but something is different in them. They're holding on in ways that I don't understand. I need to know what that is. How are you doing that? How did you forgive your spouse? How are you still showing up in your marriage? What's happening there? People are going to see you going through transition in your life, where you're stepping out of a title and a position that you worked for 30 years to obtain, and they're going to see you struggle, they're going to see you cry, but they're going to see you rise through it, and they're going to say, I don't understand that kind of peace. I don't know that kind of stability, but now I'm seeing it right in front of my eyes. There's a river where there only used to be desert. Maybe God brought you out of your comfort to change the climate for those who have lived in the desert. Maybe he's made his bride uncomfortable so that she can radiate in the desert, so that rivers of water can flow out of us. And maybe he's purging you of your greatest idol, your reputation, your image, your status, your clout, your five-year plan. I don't know about you, but mine got ripped apart. Like, I don't even have a five-minute plan anymore. Like, it's all gone. It's all changed. And maybe God has brought you to this place to strip you away. Maybe he locked you up in your house and put you in sweatpants for two years so that you can realize, I ain't that cute. Like, it's not about me. And maybe I should be seeking and desiring after him more and more. The desert has water because the people of God were in it. That's the miracle. New rivers where there were no rivers. Refreshment in the worst of climates. Maybe he's brought us here today, church, to show what it looks like to be quenched in discomfort. That I can still, even in this, thank God, that I can still in this rejoice, that I can still in this have peace. No, life is not good, but God is good. Maybe he's brought you here to show what it looks like to endure suffering, to show what it looks like to be a believer. And if that's the plan, it's well worth it. 
And then it ends this, verse 21. I've made Israel for myself, and these my people will someday honor me before the world. They will someday honor me before the world. God's aching hope here is that one day my people are gonna get it, and they're gonna honor me in front of the world, in places that it costs them something, in ways that it will lose them followers and cost them likes that my people will honor me in ways that change situations. Someday it's coming. See, we want it that way, but God is waiting for someday. Someday when we will honor him in front of the world. And it's gonna be costly. It's gonna cost you something. But that's the point. Life is different. I know. We're not going back. Can we collectively just embrace that truth? But it was never the plan to go back anywhere. We're going forward, forward. And if there happens to be a desert in front of us, so be it. If God says go, we will go. He will be with us in the desert. He will make water flow from the driest of grounds. If he says go, we will go. He's leading you forward. So let's lay down our idols. Let's turn to him and let his power be seen. I want to pray for those of you who want to accept Jesus today, and then I want to share one more thought. So if you would close your eyes for a moment, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, and maybe you're online and you say, I need to be forgiven, I need to repent. If that's you, would you just lift your hands in the room or type, I need Jesus there in the chat? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Wow, so many hands are going up. Yes, thank you. If you say, I need to be forgiven, I want Jesus. Yes, we see you here in the room. We see you there online. Can everyone pray this prayer with me? Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I want to live for you from this day forward. From now on, it's Jesus first and Jesus always. In your name I pray. Amen. This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.